open our Bibles today to Philippians chapter 1. I'll let you go ahead and be turning there, but before we do anything there, I just have a little short video clip I want you to see. Tonight, uh, as a denomination, we are practicing Acts chapter 13. You may be seated if you wish. You have before you tonight those that I am assuming and I sincerely believe that your churches and you as individuals and you as families have prayed for, fasted even, and God has reached down and selected these that you see before you to serve, to serve the National Association of Free Will Baptists as missionaries, but more than that, and I hope we never forget to serve the true and the living God, to take a message of compassion and hope to those that are around the world. These that we have behind us tonight have knowingly and willingly surrendered their lives. They heard the call and they know and they understand and we need to join in with them tonight to commit them, commission them, and say to them as a people, say to them as servants of God, we're your friends, we're your brothers, we're your sisters. We are the ones that are gonna stand behind you. Tonight I will give a charge to them, each one of you that are standing here. I will give six, I will say, commissions to you. And when I finish one, I want you to collectively say, I do, because this is an individual thing. And I want you, us to hear you as you speak. So I ask you to listen carefully. And when I say it, you can pause a second, but I want to hear a resounding, I do. Do you declare your commitment to the Bible as the ultimate authority, God's word, that will guide you in your life and in your ministry? Do you declare your resolve to live in obedience to the Holy Spirit every day? Louder. I'm, we got to get some commitment here, right? <laughs> so don't be bashful. This is the time to speak up. Do you declare your commitment to faithfully share the good news as God opens opportunities for you to do so. Amen. There we're talking. Do you declare your commitment to the doctrines, policies, and structures of the National Association of Free Will Baptists and your sending agency? I do. Do you declare your commitment to obey the biblical exhortation that as much as is within you, live at peace with all men? I do. Do you declare your commitment to safeguard the integrity of the denomination, your family, your colleagues, your fellow believers, and most importantly, the name of Christ? I do. Now I turn to you as a denomination, as people, God's people. I want you to declare to them your commitment to support these that are commissioned tonight that you will prayerfully back them up. They, they never have to wonder, you know, we hear this, have you got my six? And I think we all under the, understand that expression. Do you have my back? I want these tonight to know that every time they face the, the trials that Satan will throw their way, they don't have to worry, are people praying for me? Are people caring about me? Are people behind me at home? And if you commit tonight to that, you say, I will take their six. I will always be there. I'll have my shield and my sword, and I will fight for these people as they take the gospel to the nations. If you would do that, will you collectively say as a denomination tonight, we do. We do. You heard that. We want to pray for them now. Dr. David Crow is going to come and pray a prayer commission for these newly commissioned missionaries. All right, that was the scene that video that you saw was the scene from the National Association Missionary Service last uh, year, last summer. Uh, and where were we? We were in Birmingham. Birmingham. 
Uh, all those cities run together to, uh, for me every year. But that one was, as you could imagine, as you saw on that screen, those of you that know my family, that one was kind of special to me because that big tall drink of water was my son Tyler standing back there. As a matter of fact, that young man standing next to him was Bryson Folks, who's already in France, just left uh, just a, a couple short months ago and be working in the same area where Tyler's going to be working. They're going to be sharing a house together, uh, Tyler and Bryson. But uh, that is the scene at the National. Every year at the, our National Association meeting, we have a missionary service on Wednesday evening, and it is one of the most uplifting things you'll ever see in your life. I wanted to find a clip, and really what I wanted to show you, uh, and I used to have this clip, and I couldn't find it anywhere, of several years ago, uh, as the, all the missionaries kind of march in down an aisle, like all the ones that are there, home missionaries, our international missionaries, and they start at the back of, one of those great big arena or auditorium, wherever we happen to be that year, and they march down that center aisle at the beginning of that service and come in and take their place. The new ones that are going to be going to their field sometime in the next year, they're there for that commissioning. But all of the missionaries, whether they're being commissioned or not, if they're stateside, they come in and usually as they start down that aisle and they're carrying flags of their nation in front of them, it's a rousing ovation. And it is so inspiring. It is so inspiring to behold. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, and I think that's good and right. We honor those people as people who are, are sacrificing their lives to go and spread the gospel across the world. Each year, missionaries, home, international, that are in the States, they, they gather on this stage and they group together. Their pictures are shown on the screen and there's this big ovation. But I, what I want to ask you is, what if you were standing with them? What if you were a part of that commissioning that you just witnessed happen last year of those that are starting out are going to that field. And you might say to yourself, wait a minute, I'm not a missionary. Really? Really? And you might be asking yourself, me, a missionary? Did you hear anything in those uh, challenges? That was Clint Morgan, by the way. He's the director of our international mission department that was issuing those challenges, and they were answering, I do. Is there anything you heard in there that shouldn't be the responsibility of any believer. Whether they have answered the call to go move away from their home or not, whether they have embarked on going out around to churches and raising money for their support, whether they've said, yes, I'll go to this place and live here and help in this work. Did you hear anything in those challenges that shouldn't be an I do from any one of us in our responsibility to carry the gospel. And that's what I want to talk about in Philippians chapter 1 today. And you know what? I used to try to print all this stuff big enough to where I didn't have to do this, but I'm just going to have to give it up and put on my glasses. And y'all just have to see me looking over my glasses today, all right? Can we, can we deal with that? I just can't see it without it. I try and I try to make it real big print, but I'm just going to give it up. But anyway, so we're here in this first chapter of Philippians. And Paul is opening up in this chapter with a challenge. He wants the Philippians to, to, uh, to allow God to continue to work in their lives, and he wants to help them be what God wants them to be. He wants the Philippians to live for God's glory, and that's Paul's challenge as he opens up this letter. And he's going to continue in this chapter with a challenge, and he's going to use his own personal attitude as an example of what he's telling the Philippians how he wants them to live, and how he wants them to, to view a responsibility for the gospel. And we're not going to start right at the top of the chapter. We're going to start a few verses down. You know, if Paul was anything, he was a missionary. Do you realize we're sitting here today, most, most, most uh, importantly because of Paul's trips. Do you realize Paul was the first one to carry the gospel to Europe. And most of us here are of some sort of European descent as Westerners. And so Paul, Paul's trips, missionary trips, you know, is what started the spread of the gospel through Europe and was handed down generation after generation and after generation. And you say, well, I didn't go to Europe to get saved, but you were saved in a ministry here that was probably here as a result of people that came from Europe and spread 
the word of God throughout this nation. And so just think about that and, and Paul's influence on all of us. But if we start reading in, in verse 12 of chapter 1, Paul says, But I want you to know, brethren, the things which happened to me, the things which happened to me, his circumstances, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. You see, Paul's writing this under house arrest, one of the prison epistles we call it. And he's in chains. Most of the brethren, verse 14, in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. So Paul had wanted more than anything to preach the gospel in Rome. That was Paul's goal, to make it to Rome. If you read through his epistles and his letters, you'll see his desire over and over to go to the Rome. That city was the, the hub of the empire. This is where it all kind of took place, as it were. You think of Washington, D.C. is where things happen that affect this nation or some of these big cultural centers in New York City. Well, Rome was the place, and Paul wanted to go preach the gospel in Rome. He later tells us in this same chapter that the gospel is his passion. He says later in this Philippians, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. The gospel is his passion, and naturally that missionary passion created in him a desire to reach such an influential city. He felt, you know, this is where the influence could come from. If we can get the gospel spread in Rome and go out from there, what an influence it would have. And that was his desire. Now, he had finally made it to Rome, but not necessarily as a preacher, <laughs> as a prisoner. You know, you've heard the little uh, phrase people use, well, I want to do this, I want this, I want this, but not like that. <laughs> That's kind of like, you know, Paul, I want to go to Rome, I want to go to Rome, but not necessarily like this. Nevertheless, He's there. He's there. So what was he going to do? Was he going to pack it up? This is not how I wanted to come to Rome. Was he going to give up on, on his desire and his passion to spread the gospel? Would he resign to the fact that there would never be a gospel witness in Rome? That's not what he did, as we read here. Paul didn't give up his passion because of his inconvenient situation, because of his circumstances. He, he was still determined, no matter what, he was going to live his life on mission for God, whatever the circumstance that took him there. And we see that he's doing that. And so, what about you? What circumstance or situation is it that you're living in right now that you would consider makes it too difficult for you to be a missionary? Now, you can think about that in two respects. Number one, what is it? What, what is it that is in your life and there may be something legitimate there, but, but for many of us, it wouldn't be a hindrance. Is there really something that would hinder you right now where you're at from being part of those people that stood up on that stage and, and were commissioned as missionaries? Really? Is there? You know, I look right here, and I didn't tell her I was going to do this, and I didn't know I was going to do this until I saw you, Evelyn, but I see Evelyn Israel sitting right here. Evelyn, how long have you been living in America? 30 plus years, pretty, pretty settled. And what is it that you've been doing for the past, uh, what is it, a couple of years now, Evelyn? Talk, talk loud enough or I'll, I'll kind of repeat what you, well, I'll just say it for you. I don't want to embarrass you. She's been leaving her home here in America and dropping everything and going to the Philippines and working in a ministry for Christ. Now, you had a job here, didn't you? Worked for Suddenlink, if I recall. So you didn't say my job hindering me. You know, I've got a home here. I've got family here. I've got this here. I've got that here. I've got all this going on. And yet she's doing it. And I, again, I don't want to embarrass you, but it's just a great example. What would hinder any of us from standing up there and being a missionary in that kind of respect? Now, secondarily, what hinders you from being that missionary right where you are without leaving your neighborhood? 
is there any circumstance? Paul's circumstance is that he was sitting in chains. Did he let that hinder him from spreading the gospel? We're going to see, no, he did not. And you see that through all of his letters. He did not let that be a hindrance. Have you decided that your situation, whatever it may be, there's a busyness, there's a health situation, there's this kind of, there's this. Have you decided that that situation is really what hinders you from spreading the gospel? And is that really what God would have us do? You probably thought when I asked you about seeing yourself in that video, I meant you being called to some other city or some, some forward foreign field. Well, again, that's possible, and you shouldn't close your mind to that. No matter what life stage you're in, you can be used. You can be used of God. But what about a responsibility right where we are right now? You know, have we decided that, you know, this culture we're living in now and the, and the things that are going on today, you know, the culture is just too far gone. They're too wicked. Nobody's going to listen to me. Have we decided that? Have we decided that, you know, if we're still in the workplace, that our workplace is too, too, too hostile to the cause of Christ? Um, you know, the, those of our kids and our grandkids that are going to school, can they decide, well, you know, you're just not supposed to talk to, about Jesus at school. Um, you know, do we let our, our situation, our circumstances dictate? Do you think that your group of friends have all made up their mind about spiritual things or religion and you're not going to convince them? And besides, you don't want them to think you're, you know, as Jeff talked about, weird. You know, <laughs> we ought to be a little weird. We ought to be a little different. We ought to be to the point where, you know, we talk about Christ, but we do, but we do, we let that fear of being kind of ostracized stop us from sharing Christ in our friend group. You know, where it is you meet, meet people. You know, I, I see some of you out, uh, you know, at various places, you know, like Hardy's or somewhere every morning in a big group of you. Do, do, do we let the fear of, of being ostracized from that group keep us from talking about what the Lord means to us in our life and being a gospel witness? What is it? What circumstance could cause that? Do you put serving Christ on hold and become self-centered when things aren't so rosy? Do any of us do that? Paul is going to, going to kind of give a prescription in this passage to how we can fulfill our, our, our missionary responsibility wherever we are, whether it's called to a, another place somewhere or whether it's right where we live. Paul's going to talk about our, a view of the gospel and how we should view where we find ourselves. And so he starts doing that right in verse 12. The first thing he's going to tell us is, you know what, the, the gospel can be advanced because of our circumstances. The gospel can be advanced because of our circumstances. Now, it's very interesting. Jeremy, you know, he's so good to come in and, and put these things on the screen for us each week based on our, our, the notes he gets and things like that. And he asked me as he was putting this, he said, I want to make sure this first point is right because a lot of times we say we could, the gospel can be advanced in spite of our circumstances. And that's true. But it's a different view that Paul's saying here, not just in spite of the circumstances, but because of them. Did you ever, did you ever stop to think that God may have put something in your path that's a little unpleasant or something you didn't, somewhere you didn't expect to find yourself so that you could be used to share the gospel where you are? Now, sure, it's still in spite of it, but because of it. The gospel can be advanced because of our circumstances. A lot of bad things had happened to Paul up to this point. You know, there's a laundry list, you know, he puts in some of these passages of Scripture uh, that he's been beaten, he'd been run out of town, he'd been arrested, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been chained to Roman soldiers. Did any of this stop the advancement of the gospel? He's saying it's the opposite. It didn't stop the advancement of the gospel. He said it was the furtherance. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the what? The furtherance of the gospel. That prayer, Jeff, has challenged us all to pray that the word of God would speed ahead through our ministries of our church. Whatever our circumstances, they happen to us for the furtherance of the gospel. And this furtherance, this advance, it's the idea of, of a military unit advancing on some position is what this word carries with it. 
uh, clearing obstructions and, uh, and uh, you know, clearing out hindrances and obstructions that might keep an entire military company from advancing. That's what Paul says. You know, sometimes we view our circumstances like that, but they happen so that the gospel can be advanced. 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9 says this, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. And so here's Paul in Philippians. He's chained under house arrest. And he's saying the word of God is not chained. Charles Spurgeon's wife, uh, I, I never knew about this until I read a, a, uh, an illustration in a book about this. His wife, Susanna Spurgeon, she, she became an invalid very early in their married life. Now, I don't know exactly what her ailment was or, or what the source of her health problems were, but she, she, was, she was incapacitated. And it limited her ministry as a pastor's wife, as Spurgeon's wife. But you know what? God gave her a burden. And her burden was to share her husband's books with preachers that were unable to purchase them. And so she had this ministry of trying to get books in the hands of these preachers that couldn't afford to buy them. And so she founded the, the book fund, is what they called it. And she worked right from her home, providing thousands of pastors with tools that they could read of Spurgeon's sermons and books that would help them in their ministry. And she supervised this thing right from her home. So she didn't let the circumstances of her being an invalid keep her from doing what she could do to advance the cause of Christ. How many of you know the name Fanny Crosby? We sing all kinds of her songs. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Pray, that's Fanny Crosby. Uh, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I'll know him by the prince of the nails in his hands. Some of those dearest uh, hymn, hymn words that we know by heart came from Fanny Crosby. Did you know that she was blind from six years of age, six weeks of age? She spent her life blind. But she determined not to be confined by her chains of darkness. And she became a mighty force for God. And we sing her hymns today. And so circumstances cannot hinder us. And I would venture to say, you know, who knows, but would Fanny Crosby had become such a prolific hymn writer and poetry writer had she not been blind? Did that cause her to be put in a place where she had time to, to work on that craft and those kinds of things? Would Spurgeon's wife had had time if she were able to go about everywhere with him to, to oversee this book fund? We don't know, but what God puts circumstances in our life and in our way so that he can use us specifically because of that situation and in spite of that situation. Because you know what? Circumstances, we see in verse, 10, verse 13, can give us contact with the lost. Circumstances can give us contact with the lost. Look at verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. These are the guys that are guarding Paul. If he had not been in prison and in chains with those folks, would they have ever heard the gospel? Would they have ever seen this man who had dedicated his life to the cause of Christ? Would they heard as people come to visit Paul, Paul talking about Christ and his ministry with those people. He was chained to these Roman guards 24 hours a day, probably six shifts, so four different guys a day. Members of the palace guard coming and, and hearing every visitor that Paul received uh, talking about the work of God and his relationship with Christ. Hearing every letter Paul dictated from that prison. And those palace guards are sitting hearing Paul talk about Christ and what he's done. And so because of where Paul was, those people heard the gospel. Every, co every conversation he had with the guards themselves, I, I, I scarcely would believe that Paul would never talk to them about Christ. And so if Paul had been free, would these guards have ever heard the story of the gospel? So the circumstances you find yourself in may be so that the people that are right around you in that circumstance can have and hear a faithful witness of the gospel. I've heard many of you tell me when you've been in the hospital or something like that. You know, I've been talking to my nurse, and I've been talking to her about where we go to church. I've been talking to her about the Lord, 
I don't know if she's saved or not. And so God may have put you in that hospital bed so that that person on that nurse's shift would hear what it means to live the life of a Christian. That's why we ought to be ready not just to talk about, oh, yeah, do you go to church? We ought to be ready to talk about the gospel. We ought to be ready to share with someone what the gospel means and what it means that Christ died and rose from the dead and how they can have new life in him. And so if Paul had been free, those guards would never have heard that. Officials in Caesar's court were dealing daily with Paul's case and, and researching this sect that they called Christianity to see what it was all about. And so they're being exposed to the gospel of Christ. What about a cancer patient who becomes a powerful witness to everybody that's in that treatment center when they go and get those treatments? Um, what about a family who loses a loved one and talks uh, to everybody that's, that's involved around that about their determination that they're going to see that, that, that loved one again and how they know that? What about your circumstances? You know, some people have, have, have said this about storms. Some of it put the word trial in, but whatever. You know, e every one of us are experiencing a trial right now, have just come through experiencing a trial, or are going to experience a trial. <laughs> every one of us. We don't escape it. And so what is God going to do? Where is, he, where is he going to place you? What circumstance is he going to put you in? And who is going to be there around you that needs to hear about the gospel? How are we going to react? How are we going to use it to share our faith with lost people? And so we know that our circumstances allow us to share the gospel. And it allow people to be exposed to the gospel. The second thing in verse 14 I think we see is our circumstances give confidence to other believers. Verse 14, Paul saying, most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Many believers in Rome had become intimidated by the government and their animosity toward Christianity. Uh, they had gone quiet about their faith because of this fear. But now here's Paul who was certainly enduring more, enduring more persecution than they were in prison, and yet he was bold to speak. And so now, you know what? Maybe I should be more bold. Maybe I should be more like Paul. And so these people who may have been a little bit hesitant to talk about their faith now are more bold because of what they're observing in Paul and what they see is going on. And so they're becoming more bold to speak. And this word speak, it doesn't necessarily mean preaching. It just means their everyday conversation. And their everyday uh, talking with people as they went about were more bold to talk about Christ because of Paul. Do we think about that missionary responsibility in our everyday conversations? Do we think about the fact that maybe we didn't stand on that stage with that group of people, but we've had a commission no less and we do have it in the Word of God. And we carry that responsibility. And do we think about that responsibility as we go about day to day talking to the people we come in contact with? And that's the question we've got to ask, is, ask ourselves. You know, America, uh, for a long time, a lot of people have been saying is becoming. We may be able to just go ahead and say now has become a post-Christian nation. That's where we are, folks. If we're not already there, we're headed there very rapidly. And, and, and there are more people. Some people are calling them the nuns. Some people call them the don'ts. <laughs> you know, when, when, when you say, when they fill out a, a thing and they ask, you know, what, what religious affiliation. And more people than ever in the history of America now check the box that says none. Some people are calling him, I heard on the radio yesterday, George Barnum was being interviewed on the radio, and they, they're calling him the don'ts. They don't believe in God, or they don't care if there's a God, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't know, they don't care, they just live their life, whether there's a God or not. And that's the type, more and more of the type of society we're living in. We're sort of insulated from that a little bit, where we are right here. You know, you folks are here on a Wednesday morning. 
<laughs> to read the Bible and pray together. You know, this is not the crowd we're talking about. And so we kind of get in this little cocoon sometimes with people. It's kind of like an echo chamber and the, 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 the circles we run in. And, of course, we're here in the south, and so there's a little more probably, uh, you know, that have at least some kind of background and knowledge of Jesus. But, folks, let me tell you, it's more and more the case. Um, you know, do, uh, you remember uh, Caitlin Fletcher that got baptized here uh, just, a, just a couple months ago. And living right here in the south in North Carolina, and, and her testimony is to us that well, she, she really never heard. She'd probably heard the name of Jesus, but never heard what it was all about. And so starting from square one and learning about, you know, what the Word of God says and what, what Jesus is and who He is and, and all those kinds of things. That's the kind of society we're living in. And so there are more and more people that are kind of hostile toward the faith. We kind of get comfortable. You know, we've got a beautiful church building to come here and worship in. And we come here weekly. And uh, we've got nice homes. You know, you, you've got a nice place to stay. And the heat works and the air condition works and, and those kinds of things. And, and you, got, you had some, some, something in your closet that was clean that you probably didn't wear yesterday to put on. Uh, you know, uh, and we have... We have pretty nice you probably probably drove a fairly decent car to get here today you know you weren't worried about it breaking down on the side of the road not things happen but all in all you know you're you're confident in that car and we 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 have all this comfort to the point where you know we forget about our responsibility and the kind of situation we're living in here and the responsibility we have to carry the gospel to people that that know nothing about it or don't know much about it at all you know there are countries around the world that have wicked governments and and groups that threaten and harass and even murder christians it's in these places you know a lot of times where god is doing a mighty work to reach the lost because those people aren't comfortable where they are and so the lord is all they have to lean on and so do we need to get back to the place in these circumstances that, that man, God's all we have and we find he's all, all we need. And so we're, we're more eager to share. And that's what we have to lean on. And so every time you see persecution going on around the world, it's a time of great, great growth and revival. And maybe we've forgotten to pick up this responsibility because we don't experience this persecution in our, our little cocoon we live in. It's true that that we're inspired and motivated by the stories of people that stand strong in their faith when we see them. We might see movie clips or read books about people that are, are suffering for the cause of Christ and we're inspired and motivate, motivated by that. And so we're reminded in all those things that bad circumstances, here's what I want us to remember, bad circumstances will not stop the advancing of the gospel. They will help to further advance the gospel because of the lost people who are touched and the believers who become bold enough to share their faith. Paul's saying here, you know what, because of what I'm going through, because of these circumstances in this, this evil culture we're living here in Rome, the Christians here are becoming more bold. And so I want to challenge us, don't get too comfortable with, with how we live and where we live that we're not bold. That we're not bold. And so another thing I want us to see in this passage, also in verse 13, is the gospel can often be advanced in current events. Verse 13, it's become evident to the whole palace guard and the rest that my chains are in Christ. Um, do you think that there was any talk about what was going on around Rome. Here, here was a prisoner in the palace guard, and so there's no doubt, you know, if, if they'd had CNN or Fox News, one of the headlines might have talked about, well, we've got this Paul in prison here, and uh, he's been going around, you know, doing these things against the empire and, and these kinds of things. And so no doubt this was a, a, some curiosity and interest going on Around and so this could have been another platform that 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 gave uh, an instance for believers to share about their faith. Everyday conversations may have come up about Paul around this around this palace and around all these goings on, uh, and giving them an opportunity to explain about their faith. And so, what about now? 
in the current climate we live? Are there any current issues going on that have to do with faith in Christ and, and morals and things like that? Do you think we, we read about any headlines about things like that? Sure we do. There are so many things going on in our culture that, that they, they have such a spiritual, even if it's not talked about that way in the news, we see it, it has a spiritual warfare element to it. The kinds of things that we're seeing that are being debated in the town square, here in our cities and in our country, they have moral and spiritual significance. When we talk about our identity and how God made us and, and uh, you know, God making male and female and God intending marriage for male and female and all these things in the headlines that, that go right fly in the face of that, these are current events that give us cause to have conversations about these things with people. And when we have those conversations with people, are we able to lovingly point them to a biblical worldview and why we have the opinion we have and where we root that opinion and, and maybe what Jesus had to say about some of these things. And so, you know, I'm thankful for uh, uh, institutions like Focus on the Family. And, and sort of will we'll give commentary on all these things. And uh, the American Family Association, there's a, there's a radio station right here, 91.7 is American Family Radio. And they'll talk about all these current issues that are going on and try to present the biblical worldview of those things so that you, as you listen to that, you can be better prepared in your own heart and mind to give a defense because of all these current events that are going on. And so how do we react when some of these subjects come up in our everyday conversations, like same-sex marriage or, or gender identity? Uh, even, you know, among our churches right here in this town, who, who can be ordained as a minister? <laughs> you know, we, we have these conversations because these are current events going on all around us. What about the economy? You know, does that ever come up in your conversations? Do you take that opportunity to talk about, you know what, really, our treasure is not here anyway. Our treasure is in heaven. That's what Jesus said. And so, you know, all of these things can be used. Whatever the issue, issue a missionary, somebody who's taken up the responsibility and the commissioning as a missionary, uses these, these opportunities to take a biblical worldview and be willing to share it and be, be willing to stand for it in the midst of their conversations. And so current events can be, can be used to advance the gospel. Thirdly, in these next verses, you know, the gospel can even be advanced in spite of conflict. The gospel can even be advanced in spite of conflict. What was the conflict here? Well, it wasn't the message of the gospel. Look at verses 15 and 18. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. So what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And so Paul saying the conflict here is not the message, but it's the motive of those that are preaching the message. Why are they preaching it? Are they preaching it out of envy and strife? Are they preaching it out of selfish ambition? Are they preach and think they're going to, you know, kind of get my goat or whatever. Add to my affliction, he says. You know, he says, you know what? Whatever their motive is, I'll praise God that the gospel's preached. Even in, the, even in, the, in the, uh, this, this air of conflict about things, the gospel can be preached. And you know, um, sometimes we think conflict, and, and I do think for the most part this is true. Conflict in a church, conflict between different factions or different churches can be a, a hindrance to the cause of Christ. And that happens when we act unloving toward one another. But do you realize that sometimes, sometimes conflict is worth it? Sometimes there is a cause that makes conflict worth it. 
but it doesn't mean we have to act unloving about it. Jeff said it Sunday. You know, he said there's a thousand, a thousand wrong ways to be right. Is that how he said it? <laughs> you know, it's our demeanor. It's how we carry ourselves. And even in the midst of standing for truth, we can do so in a loving way. You know, Paul probably had every right to just land blast some of these folks that he knew were, were trying to, to, to uh, have a ministry out of their own selfish ambition and make a name and a following for themselves or perhaps get gain for it. Or even those that were doing it in spite and talking him down. Well, look over here. You don't want to follow him. He's in jail. Um, Paul could have just, just railed against those people. And a lot of us probably would have said, yeah, you go. You're right. That's not what he did. That's not what he did. He said, in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I'll rejoice for the sake of the gospel. And so even in the midst of conflict and strife sometimes, if we can handle that in a loving way, that can be a witness to people. Well, why, why is it that you're part of ways with that over there? Well, it's just because I'm convinced of this and this and this out of the word of God. And I know that they, 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 they believe this way about it and uh you know that's that that's what they've decided and that's what they're standing on but i've just become convinced of this way and we don't we don't have to run people down so that's what paul is doing here he's using uh you know people that were using paul's imprisonment as a means to advance their own cause to try to step in and take you know where, where they could kind of fill a void he doesn't go in great deal detail about it, but he want because he wants the Philippians to know, look, it's not about me, it's about the gospel. Now there were others that were re- preaching from the right motive, from from goodwill, and he says, man, I you I pr- I'll promote them as well. One of the chapters in a book we're currently reading, the staff right here talks about being kingdom minded, and and getting away from this thought that we're 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 almost kind of like Ugh, when we hear about another church doing real good. <laughs> You got that little competitive spirit. That is not that is not about the kingdom. We ought to praise the Lord for another church that's seeing people saved and growing and having things going on. We ought to praise the Lord when we see somebody able to to uh, do those kinds of things. And so that's what Paul's talking about. They love the Lord. They love each other. And there was an emphasis on love for Paul too in some of these people. One group was preaching Christ not for for Christ's glory but their own. Uh, they're, they're, it's almost like they're running for political office in their own selfish ambition. They're criticizing Paul, adding to his distress. But Paul's stance, as long as you're preaching Christ, I don't care if you're for me or against me. Christ is still preached. You know, every church is not going to do things the same way we do right here. Um, and so, Certainly, you know, we're not, going to, we're not going to match every other church. What's more, even among this congregation, everybody might not agree all the time on a certain way to do something. We understand that. You know, anytime you got more than one person, you're going to have a different opinion. <laughs> I don't even agree with myself sometimes <laughs> when I think about it long and hard enough. So that's going to happen but if we're preaching the gospel, that's okay. We don't have to. We don't have to line up on every little thing. If we line up on, on the foundational truths of the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and He is the only way, praise God for them. Praise God for them. And so maybe if we get past petty differences and the opinion on, on uh, and we can work together and encourage one another for the cause of Christ. You know, maybe as we look around and we, and we take up this mantle as a missionary and we look around and, and, and more and more, look, look folks, how many, how many, is there anybody in this room that raised your hand and said, I knew everybody by first name that was here Sunday? I'll put my hand down because I didn't either. You know, there are more and more and more different folks going to come through these doors. Praise the Lord, right? Praise the Lord, right? Right. And so, the, guess what? They're going to be different from us. They're not, everybody's not going to have the same view of how you ought to do something. Everybody's not going to have the same view of, 
of how this ought to be done or that ought to be done or what they like this and I don't like that. But guess what? They need Christ. They need to hear the gospel. Guess what? You need to hear the gospel. I need to hear the gospel. We need to preach the gospel to one another. And these folks are coming for some reason of a spiritual hunger. They, they, some, somebody didn't just, you know, bring them over here and throw them in the door. They came on purpose. They came on purpose. And so sometimes we might have to get past. I can't walk away from there. I'll get out of the camera. We have to get past um, if, 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 if things aren't going just exactly like we might want it. Because we got to do some things for the sake of the other people that are coming through these doors that need the Lord just like we need Him. And so we've got to think, you know, we've got to put ourselves aside sometimes, some of these conflicts aside sometimes and say, you know what, Christ is being preached and I'll praise the Lord for it. We've got to open our hearts. Two of the most influential and famous preachers in our nation's history and in the, in the spread of God's work through our nation, uh, John Wesley George Whitfield. They were contemporaries. They're both famous preachers, revival movements. You know, Wesley, uh, you know, anything that says Methodist on it is birthed out of Wesley's ministry mainly. Uh, and, you know, many of those churches have, have been great witnesses for the gospel through our nation's history. That movement started by Wesley. George Whitfield spreading revival across our land and, and crusades and those kinds of things. And so they were both very influential. Revival was spread. Churches were started. And they were a gospel witness in so many communities throughout our country. And guess what? The two of them, they disagreed on several doctrinal issues. Wesley and Whitfield. And so somebody approached Wesley one time and asked him, you know, some, some of their disagreement was a little bit public. And somebody asked Wesley, will you see Whitfield in heaven? And Wesley said, no. And this man said, so you don't think he's really saved? And Wesley said, oh, I believe he's saved all right. It's just that I think he'll be so close to the throne of God, and I'll be so far away from it that I may never see him there. And so that's the view that Wesley had of a contemporary that he had disagreements with. You know, we can have disagreements with somebody and still believe they, they love the Lord. And have a heart for the Lord. So how much further would the gospel have been advanced in Rome. If all these people had take, taken an attitude of standing together with Paul. Instead of having some of these, these envies and strifes and things like that. Paul saying I'm not concerned. If I can agree with you on every minor issue. If you're preaching the word of God. Praise the Lord. I'll rejoice. Yes I will rejoice. He says in verse 18. And so we're going to face difficult circumstances. We know that. We're going to have our critics. We know that. But if we live for a higher cause and we live for the purpose of being a missionary to advance the gospel wherever we are, that is going to please the Lord. And that's what Paul's talking about. There was a man by the name of Joseph Tan. He was the pastor of the Second Baptist Church in Oradia, Romania. But he was exiled by the Romanian government in 1981, sent away. And uh, there's a book called Pastoral Renewal, and he writes this. He says, years ago, I ran away from my country to study theology at Oxford. This was in the midst of this exile. In 1972, when I was ready to go back to Romania, I discussed my plans with some fellow students. They pointed out that I might be arrested at the border. One student asked, Joseph, what chances do you have of successfully implementing your plans? Well, Joseph Ask God about it. And God brought to mind Matthew 10, 16. I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. And so he seemed, this is Joseph talking now in this book. He seemed to be saying to me, tell me, what chance does a sheep surrounded by wolves have of surviving five minutes, let alone of converting the wolves? <laughs> Joseph, that's how I send you. Totally defenseless, without a reasonable hope, of success. If you're willing to go like that, go. If you're not willing to be in that position, don't go. That's what Joseph Tan said he felt like the Lord speaking to him. 
And so he says, after our return, as I preached uninhibitedly, harassments and arrests, and arrests came. One day during interrogation, an officer threatened to kill me. I said, sir, your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Sir, you know my sermons are all over the country on tapes now. If you kill me, you'll be sprinkling them with my blood. <laughs> Whoever listens to them after that will say, I better listen to this. This man sealed it with his blood. They will speak ten times louder than before. So go on and kill me. I will win the supreme victory then. And the officer sent him home. <laughs> He said, that gave me pause for years as a Christian who was cautious. Uh, th this is the writer now talking about this. That gave me pause for years as a Christian who was cautious because I wanted to survive. I had accepted all the restrictions the authorities put on me because I wanted to live. Now I wanted to die and they wouldn't oblige. Now I could do whatever I wanted in Romania. For years I wanted to save my life and I was losing it. Now that I wanted to lose it, I was winning it. And so, circumstances. It's pretty severe circumstances that this pastor had. And he realized, you know what? Through these circumstances, God, God's going to have the gospel spread either way. If I will allow him to use me. Either in my life, as I go on preaching, or even in my death. As the word will spread even further and with more conviction. And so what are you thinking about your circumstances right now? Are you a missionary? Are you willing to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to live as a missionary for the cause of Christ? Can you stand up with those people that stood on there that commissioning and say, I do. What are you willing to do and what are you willing to say for the sake of the gospel? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the message of the gospel, the fact that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose on the third day, and in so doing, paid the debt of our sin, gave us a promise of forgiveness, gave us access to the Father, and gave us a hope and promise of eternal life and rising from the dead. And so we praise you for that message, and I pray that you will help us to be uh, bearers of that message in the midst and because of our circumstances, the opportunities that those circumstances give us. Help us to be bold. Help us to put aside petty differences. Help us to use everything we can to be witnesses for you and missionaries for you. In Jesus' name.